Hey, welcome back everybody to my podcast. And today's guest is Sir John Kerwin from New Zealand. He's a big mental health ad advocate. He used to be a player for the All Blacks and became a, the head coach of the All Blacks, as well as the head coach of the rugby national team in Japan and Italy. He speaks fluent Italian as well as some Japanese. And today we talked about mental health from A to Z, from, from things you can do on a daily basis, uh, how to take care of yourself. And, and he gave a lot of practical advice. If you watch it, you'll see his PowerPoint presentation um, that was handwritten. And uh, yeah, if you like this episode, please subscribe, please share. It's a big, big episode. It's the first of a kind uh, for me. So I think that it's going to be a very valuable one. It's going to widen your horizon. And I hope you enjoyed it. Please share, please subscribe and see you soon. Bye. All right, John, thanks for coming on. You're welcome, man. You're welcome. I'm, um, it's my, my pleasure. You're uh, in Germany and I'm in little old New Zealand. So how do I pronounce your name properly? Is it Benas? Benas, yeah. Benas. Ben Mat how about my last name, Matkevichus? Um, yeah, Matkevichus. Mat yeah, that's good. That's good. I'll, I'll take that. Like when we when we live in New Zealand, we have um, we have lots of Pacifica. Ah. Um, so, so when we are on television, we we must obviously could pronounce someone's name correctly is very very important for all of us. So we learn to break them down a bit and understand where the apostrophes come. So yeah, I, I looked at your name, Mate Mate Victus, but probably without so with the C and just understanding how you pronounce your vowels. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I lived in the states for five years, so I heard all sorts of pronunciations. That was that's uh, you know when you when you play in college or high school, you have student sections, and they just go to work with my name. So it was I heard I heard everything. Beautiful. So today I tell I have a lot of guests on that have achievements in coaching and playing, and I always tell my guests that may may all the achievements and the accomplishments rest in peace. Today we're going to talk about things that are um, a little bit below the surface, more nuanced, and, and try to get people educated on different topics. And today with you, I wanted to talk about the mental health aspect in sports, but from the player's perspective, because you have player's perspective in, in high-level rugby, from the coach's perspective, which you also have a high level, and then mm -hmm. take the, taking the cultural aspect uh, of it and connecting it to a winning environment. Are you ready for that? Born ready, brother. <laughs> I know, I know you've 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 uh, you've told the story a million times probably by now, and I know that that your first encounter with mental mental health that where it was very a crucial and a sliding door moment probably in your life was in 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 Argentina in Buenos Aires as, as I understood. Um, could you tell the listeners just a little bit just to touch on of what your initial initial point was of of realizing that there there's a problem that exists that's a little bit deeper than 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 you could have thought of yeah like um so i think for me firstly um understanding that it was a problem was very very interesting because i'd been hiding my mental health for five years because i had no idea what it was and i had no reference to it so probably your american listeners I uh, might remember this film, but my reference to mental health was One Flow of the Cuckoo's Nest, right? Mm -hmm. With Jack Nicholson and Chief, the big American Indian guy. So I felt that if I spoke about my mental health, um, I would be locked up with those two, you know, and I can laugh a little bit about it now because in New Zealand, when you can laugh at something, you're getting better <laughs> and you're well <laughs> um, um, around a serious topic. So basically what happened with me, if I look retrospectively in my life, I probably had some anxiety attacks and some anxiety issues growing up, but it didn't affect my life, right? I'd have them occasionally and ignored them, didn't know what they were, just weird moments in my life. Um, I made the All Blacks, I was the third youngest to make the All Blacks. So I was 19 years, three months, three weeks and three days or something like that, you know, third youngest, 19 years of age. I'd made what you would say, like if it's the NBA or, you know, a, a, a soccer team, I'd made the first team the year before at 18 in, in one of the biggest provinces. So, um, and was having a good life, man. Like life was good, achieving my goals, you know, make the All Blacks dream come true. Um, and then I've had these little episodes of 
of anxiety and ignored them, right? Um, playing the house down, winning World Cups, doing all sorts of you know great things, um, but just ignoring my my mental health. So these anxiety attacks were coming more frequently, um, and then I was ignoring them, and I was going back to normal, up and down, and then one day they just didn't go away. So I also um, have a monkey brain and was having suicidal ruminations. Um, you know, I never thank God or Allah or whoever you believe in. Um, I, I thank God that I never, um, you know, sort of organized my own suicide. So I was living this personal hell without really talking to each other, talking to anyone about it. And I went on an all black rugby tour in 1990 to Argentina and I was a complete mess. Faking it, no one knew. Scoring tries, you know, running on instinct more than anything. Um, but the tank was low. So the, what used to happen, I say, you know, um, when you're in that hell, a minute feels like an hour, an hour feels like a day, and a day feels like a week, right? So it came to an head. Um, one night I'd been fighting all day. I uh, had about 20 anxiety attacks. Um and I'm lying in bed and I just said to myself, I've had enough. I'm going to run and jump out the window. I was on the 10th floor of the Hilton in Buenos Aires. The window was open. I can still see the curtains fluttering. And I decided to run and jump out. Um, I was sick of fighting it. And my roommate, as you know, you've been on many a, many a uh, in, uh, you know, basketball trip. My roommate said to me, JK, you've got a good heart. And he saved my life. Um, I didn't jump out the window. I got through that evening. I played a test match the next day. Um, I scored two tries against Argentina. It was like watching myself in a dream, you know? Um, and I flew home and, I, and I, I finally reached out to my family and then I went to the doctor. The doctor was the all black doctor. We'd been on tour for five weeks and I never spoken to him about it. Wow. Yeah, and um, the first thing he said, it changed my life. He said, JK, it's an illness, not a weakness. Wow. It's an illness, not a weakness. I can get through an illness. You know, the three things that depression and anxiety does to you, takes away your self-esteem, takes away your self-confidence, and takes away your enjoyment in life. Life's pretty shitty um, being asked without those three things, right? And so I started this, this journey of understanding mental health, understanding me, understanding how my mind works. And, you know, I started building um, a daily mental health plan that took me from surviving to thriving, you know. And it's really, really different because um, there's sort of three things that are very prominent today. Um, most mental health is, we talk about the ambulance at bottom of the cliff. So 750,000 people committed suicide last year, brother. That's a pandemic, you know, in our beautiful, my beautiful little country by the end of tonight, a New Zealand male will be dead by tomorrow night, two males and one female, you know? So oh. this is a pandemic around the world, bro. And um, one of my passions is if I can go from surviving to thriving, anyone can. 4% of the population are born with some sort of mental health issues, schizophrenia, bipolar, you know, personality disorders. And there's a lot of great work going in there. But the mental health of the world is going the wrong way, man, right? Through the amazing um, capacity of our brains now. You know, you get more inputs today than your grandparents had in a lifetime, right? So the three things I'll get back to, especially when you're talking about sport, and especially if you're talking about being an athlete or, or a coach, right? There is, there is bad mental health, right? So you're unwell like I was. Um, there is also uh, sports psychology, that has to do with performance. It's got nothing to do with what, what I've just spoken about, right? Um, so there is, and, the, th and the, third, the third thing is actually having a daily mental health plan that is based in science that can get you through whatever the world throws at you, whether you're a basketball player, whether you're a coach, whether you're just a manager trying to be the best you can be, whether you've just been promoted and now you've got 40 people under you. The biggest issue in your life to success will be understanding and having empathy towards mental health. You, you, you're watching your, your, yourself 
firstly, right? That's that's the thing. You you basically in every situation, everything that's that's getting thrown at you, you're basically looking at the mirror every time and seeing how you feel from the inside and see how you react to it. Yeah, look, I think I think that's a pressure situation and that's a sports issue and a life issue. What I'm saying to you is how do you have a daily mental health plan so you can cope with all those things? Yeah. Right? It's actually what I call preventative mental health, right? So what do you do every single day so that you're coming into the semifinals as a coach, the pressure's on, you lose this game, you could lose your job, right? <laughs> yeah. What you need to be able to do is have a daily mental health plan that gives you the balance to deal with all those situations. If you're a player, you know, and let's not talk about during the game because in a player you get into the groove and 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 sports psychology is about how you deal with you know a green head red head but actually how are you keeping yourself well on a daily basis mental health wise yeah. and you think about the 80s man you think about you think about the 80s you think about um sport where it's come you think about health where it's come you know I don't know. How old are you? You're probably not as old as me, but most people in the 80s, mate, we 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 drank beers and smoked cigarettes, right? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> in, the <laughs> in the planes too, in the planes too. No one really gave a shit, you know. This, and then by yeah. the end of that, people are saying, "Man, you smoke, you know, you're gonna you, you you're gonna die younger, bro." So um, we got the education, and then we made a choice. And if you want to smoke today, I don't really give a shit, man, because that's your life. You've got the understanding. You know what you know what's happening, right? Yeah, mental health has been locked in the cupboard for years. We we don't know actually how bad it is for us if we don't have a daily mental health plan that keeps us thriving. And so I've done this this incredible journey of you know from wanting to jump out of a window to forming a daily mental health plan that keeps me absolutely well on a daily basis, no matter what the world throws at me. Um, but what's happening in the world because of all the information and information overload and all the pressure we have, the mental health of the world's going wrong. And I want to tell everybody, get yourself a daily mental health plan, you know? So what's, what's your daily health, uh, daily mental health plan to, is that based on your interests your, that, that are just gated towards you, or is that something universal that, that everybody can do in, in terms of what you're doing and just copy paste it or is that does that have to be well, listen, mate, you, you, you've done a lot of these right and i've got a um i've got a i i, I stayed up all night um and i did a uh, powerpoint for you brother you ready, are you ready for it? <laughs> are you ready for it mate like i am seriously good at doing um um powerpoints right are you ready there it is brother all right <laughs> move <laughs> chill listen. celebrate do enjoy and connect yeah right so um, this is based in clinical science, but when I started out, I didn't know this shit, right? So the first thing I had to do was accept my illness, right? And you've you've had a lot of, um, you know, you've had a lot of um, injuries through your career, and you know, accepting some of that stuff is hard, right? Yep. So imagine when your brain's messed up. So I had to accept my illness. I had to stop fighting it, but I could never give up. Very important thing with mental health. Never give up, but stop fighting it. So I accepted my illness. And then I then I also accepted going to a psychiatrist, right? So back then, I'm going, the, the doctor said to me, JK, um, you're clinically depressed. You need to take antidepressants. I'm going, I don't take that shit, right? Here's the same guy that's spending three hours in the gym a day, right? Also, bro, I don't know about you, but man, if the massage table was available, I was all over that shit, mate. I love that shit. <laughs> massage every day. How cool is that, brother? You know? um, I missed ice baths, thank God. That came at the end of my career, but I would have been into one of those as well, right? Um, and so I'm spending all day trying to be the best athlete I can. You know, and the doctor says, oh, JK, you know, you've got a bit of a twisted angle. Here's 400 milligrams of Voltaren, bro, to play on Saturday. You take that shit? Then I took a, I took a, I took a lot of those. I took a lot of those. And down, down Voltaren down your, injections down. too. And it's terrible. Amen, brother. Down your gob to play footy, right? So you've spent all week getting your massages, going to the gym, being on the bloody basketball port or rugby field like me. You know, you got a few niggles with docs whacking some bloody Voltaren down your gob. And you do all that to try and be the best athlete. Then the doc says to me, JK, you need to take a pill for your head and you need to go and see someone about it. And I go, no way. <laughs> it's kind of counterintuitive isn't it <clears throat> ridiculous so what, ridiculous so, when i look back on it right so so i finally go and this is getting back to the to the six pillars which are important for the world man um 
So I go to the psychiatrist and, um, you know, the first person I went to, and this is really interesting on your mental health journey, right? First person I went to, I didn't connect. So I walk in and the guy goes, JK, you're a volcano. Can you feel that power inside you? You know, get down and go. And I don't want to be a volcano, you dick, you know? Um, you need to you need to turn off that, that you need to turn that volcano off. <laughs> that's that's yeah, what you're looking okay. for. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't connect with that guy. Now I'm sure the volcano guy, you know, he helped a lot of people, but I just didn't connect. It's the last thing I needed to hear, right? right? And that put me off for another six weeks. I wouldn't go. I, I went back, told the doc. I said, I told you, doc, I'm not insane, man. Like that, what's so it was actually quite dangerous at the time. It was one step forward to have the courage to go and see someone, two steps back when I met that person, I didn't connect. And if anyone who's listening to this that might need some help, sometimes you got to find the right person you connect to, right? Put that in the sports sense. Some coaches you connect with, others don't. You yep. know what I'm saying? Some teammates you connect with, others don't. So anyway, I, I, I go, I keep going through hell. And anyway, the second person I went to, um, I go and I sit down and she said to me, JK, um, what would you do if you had a tight hamstring? I said, I'd stop and stretch. She said, good. Okay. You stopped and stretched. You get up. You keep running. What would you do if it got really, really tight? I said, I'd stop. I'd ice it and go to the physio. She said, your brain's no different, you dick. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh, man, no. You know, you're right. So I said, what's the... Um, what's the ice and who's the physio? Because I just got a hamstring in the head. Um, <laughs> a part of my problem was um, alcohol was my ice. Mm -hmm. So I'd go and get on the piss, get blind, drunk. Um, and the scary thing was it helped. It helped in the sense that it gave me some peace for a little while. But then the next day I'd go back at 100 miles an hour. So while I'd get that short-term peace, the long term was worse. So I knew that wasn't my ice. So, you know, I've, I've accepted my illness. I now have been able to translate it into something that I understand as a sportsman. So the third thing is I went looking for the ice. So, for example, she said to me, um, JK, how would you like to go to meditation? I went, woo, man. Like, this is, this is the end of the 80s, brother. Like, if you did yoga, you're a dope smoking freak. You know, there's no Lululemon around then, my man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, man, do I have to go and sit cross lettered on a mountain in Tibet? Shit. Wow, that's cool. I'll have a, you know, but I'd accepted my illness and I decided to go. Um, and I went to meditation and it was incredibly terrible for me. I got very, very anxious. And, and listen, if you can meditate and it's part of your daily mental health plan, do it, man. It's awesome. It's very, very good for you. But a small percentage of the population can't. Um, so I go back thinking I'm failed, you know, us, us, us sports people or ex-sports people, we put things in two categories, right? Success or failure, which is very dangerous in its own right. So I walked out and I couldn't meditate. So I felt that I'd failed. I go back to her and I said, well, that shit didn't work, you know? And she <laughs> says to me, um, oh, JK, maybe you have a ruminating mind and people who have a ruminating mind shouldn't meditate. And I'm going, well, I can't even spell rumination, girl. So you tell me, <laughs> you tell me what, uh, you tell me what rumination, she said, you got a monkey brain, Bob the monkey, right? So Bob the monkey, um, I need to put him in his cage, right? And he needs to have a banana. Otherwise, and I'll translate that, right? And, I, and I'm going to come back to these things, okay? So how can, how can I chill, right? How can I chill if Bob the monkey won't let me chill, right? If you've got a Netflix show, and I'm sure you're going to have a Netflix show one day, um, you know, if you've got a Netflix show and you don't entertain me in, in a minute, I'm gone, mate. You haven't got me. You know, if I go to bed and I don't read a book or do my breathing, Bob the monkey's going, yeah, JK, and he's thinking about, you know. So what I learned was that to switch my brain off, and this is in the, in the chill and the do category, right, because you can do two birds with one stone, in the chill category – I've got to disconnect my brain. I do three things. I play the guitar poorly. Sounds like I'm killing a cat, mate. But Bob the monkey goes into his goes into his cage and has a banana. If I cook, right? I, I love cooking. I look forward to cooking. I think about what I should cook. Bob the monkey hates it. Goes into his cage and has a banana. The last thing I do, and I, I, I had to teach myself how to read because I'm a little bit on the dyslexic scale. Um, I learned to read when I was 18. 
Um, if I read, Bob the Pinky goes into his cage and has a banana, right? And so when I started learning these things, you imagine having a ruminating mind, all you're thinking about is shit, right? And then you learn to, to switch it off. You give, you, you give your brain this little pause, right? And that was an incredible transformation for me. So all of a sudden, I started getting some peace in my day, started switching off my brain. So that was really attractive to me. And so then I started, and look, I didn't know about the six pillars. This is based in science, medical science. You do this, you do these things every single day. Now, you might, you might be able to meditate. I'm not saying you have to do this or that, but you need to build whatever that is, right? So for example, one thing that'll be hard for you and me as ex-athletes, move for us was going to the gym and being amazing athletes. You get to our age, man, you can't do that shit anymore. So what is move, right? And move for me is also really, really important. So we get, you know, the pressure on us, especially on our kids, but on us today is, you know, when you think about fitness and stuff, all the images you get is everyone's perfect. You get the males with the abs, you get the females who look perfect. But the reality is another thing, you know? So, so for me, it's really, really important that you start building those six pillars in your day. Now, you already know that I have three things around my chill, right? Um, and then the other thing um, that I do, you know, for do you have a to done list, Manus? To done? No, to done. Yeah. I have. I don't have a to done list. No way. So how do you know how awesome you are? <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's it feels like it, it, things never are done for me because I feel like exactly. they're 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 always there's always something to do. Yeah, exactly. Well. You, can, you need to put an NE on the end of that thing, my brother, because the trouble is with the world, right? Is your inbox ever empty? N always red, but never empty. Yeah, okay. So the world now, you, you're always got something to do around work. So there is no work-life balance. There's just life, of which they've encroached on each other. The trouble is, at the end of most days, most people go, what have I got to do? You know, what have I got to do? Yeah. Um, but at the end of today, and I want you to write this down because I'm going to make you do this. I want you to write down your to done list. What have I done today? And then at the end of it, I want to say, I want you to say to yourself, congratulations to me. Right? Because if you don't do it, is anyone else going to? No, I just it's it's on me. It's this this my my test. Yeah, that's that. And then at the end of the day, you look back and go, wow, I'm awesome. You know, Finnish, you're awesome. Did you know that? I know. I know. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident in myself. <laughs> my girlfriend, so, my girlfriend keeps me humble. <laughs> nice. well, and, and those, those things are, those things are really, really important. So if you start building your day, you know, what have you done to move? You know, it might be walking the dog, it might be going to the gym, whatever. You know, how have you switched off your brain to the to the to the podcast you've got to do, to the scouting you've got to do, you know, to the to the other things in the world. You know, what are you doing to keep yourself motivated? What you know, one of the so do you know, do you have the saying in Lithuania or in America, two birds of one stone? Yeah, yep. You do? Okay. So you should do that for your mental health. Right. So, for example, um, your move pillar. Right. If you don't connect much with your girlfriend, you go for a walk and you connect. Two pillars, two birds with one stone. You know, if I do some cooking in the house, man. Right. Who else do you think thinks I'm okay? Your wife. Amen, brother. <laughs> one stone. Bob, the monkey's, Bob the monkey's gone into his cage and had a banana, and the wife doesn't think I'm such a dick. You know, <laughs> two birds with one stone, my man. Um, so we need to start building these daily mental health plans that protect us from the anxiety, protect from pushing us off the cliff. Yep. And once you start building that, you know, you're more resilient. You start having these little things that you look forward to, you know. I think that's with whether it's athletes or regular life, like you said, I think a lot of it is rooted in perfectionism. Like the, the players, they put there's a lot of pressure. I saw a lot of pressure with the teams I worked with. Uh, especially with the national team, because there's also national pressure, which you also felt with different national teams. So I think that a lot of that 
is weighing on the players who already struggle a little bit with mental health, whether it's in in, in private or in, in in professional. But the extra layer of of pressure from the outside is contributing to that. Then I'm I'm wondering when you became a coach, you had this experience already. How did you recognize it in the players that were struggling with it? And how did you empower them to make them feel safe? Just creating a psychological safety within the working environment is so important. And I was wondering if your experiences carried over to the coaching aspect and you recognize that in some players that, man, I can help him. And I feel like there's there's certain things that need just just guiding him into the right direction. How how did you did you recognize those kind of patterns? Um, I just took it for fact that everyone would be suffering in some way. Okay. Okay. So that was the that was the baseline. That's the baseline, man. The baseline is, and you've you've been an athlete, man. The baseline is you are always going to be struggling with something. For example, as a coach, um, I would never I would address perfectionism because it is the most misused word um, and at a complete waste of time having in your environment because it's impossible. It's a bit like failure, yep. right? Um, they're two words that for me are absolutely ridiculous. One's a fantastic teacher. If you, instead of uh, being scared of it and pushing it away, if you embrace it, it's your best teacher. That's failure. But perfectionism is this bullshit word that does not exist. So um, I would replace it with something like, I want you, you, Venice, to be the best athlete you can be, right? So you and I had a little bit of a chat before we came, and um, one of the things that was mentally hard for you was you carried a lot of injuries along the way, right? So you could never be perfect. So if I had a situation where you've got to be perfect, you're going to feel uncomfortable every day. But where if I said to you, Venice, look, I need you to be the best you can be. And at the moment, you've got a sore toe, right? So you can't base jump. I'm happy to support that if if you can come within the parameters of being selected. And you might say, oh, coach, you know, I can't train Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'll talk to the leadership group and go, you know, Venice is the best three shot. You know, the, I'm, I'm talking about a game I don't know a lot about. <laughs> He's our best three. He's our best three pointer. Um, he's going to have to be on the rowing machine and off his feet until um, you know Wednesday. But he can train Thursday, Friday, play play Saturday. Are you guys okay with that? Shit, yeah. You know he's worth fifteen points a game, and we know he's training hard. How do you feel about that, right? You, you're you're that's that was the thing that you struggled with because you you're concerned of how you look to your teammates you know how the teammates look at you while you're not practicing and then you're going to play on the weekend without practicing that's kind of strange right that's that's additional pressure that kind of messes with your mind and at a high level players understand that i mean the higher high professionals understand that you need to take care of your body first but there's also this internal chatter that you just can't turn off because you're you're the worst critic of yourself most of the time whether you're a coach or a player okay and this is another this is another thing that i learned really early um, it's called a worry map, okay? So in, early in my career, um, I was worrying about the stuff that you've just said, but I learned the worry map. It's really easy. What can you control? What can't you control? What can you do? And what can't you do? So as an elite athlete, um, I was coming off the field and let's say it had been raining. I'm a winger. Um, I don't know if you know much about rugby, but... Um, 14, 14 guys need to work pretty hard to get me the ball, right? <laughs> um, so it was if it's raining, I touch the ball twice. My two efforts with the ball weren't up to my standard and I come off the field. I used to worry I was going to get dropped. I used to worry I wasn't good enough. I used to worry about a whole lot of different stuff until I learned the worry map, right? So for example, if you think about that situation I did, what can I control? What can't I control? Can I control the weather? No. Can I control that the inside center had a lot of pressure from a really good defender and couldn't get me the ball? No, right? Can I control what I did with the ball? Yeah, maybe I maybe I was living in the past instead of just taking the present so I can practice that, you know? So there's a whole lot of things. If you write a worry map out, you just get down to a to-do list, right? that you can control. 
you know, you would have been in teams where you might have been one of the better players, but the, but the coach just didn't like you, the way you play. Can you control that? No. 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 What can you do? What can you do? You can just put your effort into things that are important. And so that worry map, you start learning actually what you can control and what you can't control. So you stop stressing about stuff. And once you learn that and you externalize, because Venus, the, Venus, the one thing you said that's really important, if you leave it in your brain, it will manifest. If you externalize it, and this is a basic psychological tool, if you can externalize it, you half it, right? So so for me, there's two things. If, if you're, because I'm just being devil's advocate here sometimes also, just to just to play play this this game back and forth. There's two things. First of all, you're also thinking, at one point, does that become an excuse, right? Of you're not catching the ball or not catching the way you wanted to, whether the, if it's wet or not. And the other thing is, if it's not an excuse, if you don't look at it that way, if I'm, you know, you're you're trying to convince yourself that it's it, this is how it was. How do you know that you're you're not you're not going to worry about? It? How do you know that the coach is thinking the same way and he's also justifying that this is we can't control this is out of our control you're trying to be the best version you can be and not worry about it not that the ball was wet but the coach sees it in a completely different way that you have to catch it anyway i don't care because my coach used to say good players make bad passes look good so you have to be able to catch bad passes also yeah and i've got no issues with that right um so let's go back to your sore toe and you can't train right as a coach, I need your three points, right? So all of a sudden, we've done the team training. You come out, and I'm making shit up here, brother, and you sit on a chair, and you do 23 pointers. As a coach, I know that you are actually doing what you can to make sure you're ready for Saturday. Right. You know what I mean? So, for example, um, making a good pass bad, you know, sometimes coaches coach people – on a reference to the elitist level, you know, and I'll keep coming back to your game, you know, um, I want you to be like LeBron James. <laughs> yeah, right, oh, mate, you know, um, that could be my end goal, but LeBron James also missed a th few three-pointers and, you know, one of the great things probably about athletes like LeBron James is they keep getting better. Why do they keep getting better? Because they're not the finished product. But sometimes as coaches, don't look at some of your mid-level athletes as if, don't put the pressure on them to be the finished article. Show them the road to get there. Yep. Right? So, okay, I didn't do that perfect pass, and I've got a coach who says, you know, good players. I, I, I would look at them and go, well, well, tell me how to do it then, right? But if the coach then saw me out doing that pass under pressure, you know, on, on, on the Monday, someone's running at me with a tackle bag and I'm doing those 20 passes, that's – that is taking control and not worrying about, right? You you think about the pressure of me saying to you, hey, man, LeBron would have got that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But LeBron didn't get it eight years ago, and he stayed in the gym for four hours and took control. He didn't worry about not getting it. He took control, and he just said, I'm going to do 50 of these. I'm, I'm making this shit up, but I'm just right. trying to, right. you know. We'll yeah, talk yeah. about the, a lot of the world don't know our game. So I'm trying to put it into sense of, you know, um, you know, sure. you miss you you miss a you miss a you miss a service that loses you a tournament. Um, you know, can you get that back? No, what can you control? You can get yourself into the same situation. You could put a big speaker on the side of the tennis court, you could turn up the music, you could get your coach to create pressure, right? You can get them to stand there and, and, and put you under as much pressure and you just keep doing that service till you get it. So a lot of times when we internalize this stuff, we don't take control. We're manifesting it. We're giving it legs that it shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. That's why the monkey gives you those long answers. So just tell me to shut up, mate. No, no, you get yeah, I'm I'm good with that. I'm good with that. What what do coaches struggle with the most? Because there is there's I've I've had coaches that Put, they everybody puts pressure on themselves, right? Because there's also a need to succeed. You you kind of you want it. Your ego wants it. Everybody wants you to succeed, and you are. I've seen coaches do the wrong thing off the court by reading, over reading information, comments, uh, newspaper articles, just absorbing it, and like you said, internalizing a lot of that criticism. 
And this is, it's compounding information and compounding pressure on the coaches that at some point it just explodes to the outside unnecessarily. And you just kind of are in a constant anxiety state. What do you, what do you think apart from that? That's my experience, what I saw from other coaches, but what, what's your experience? What coaches do wrong in terms of mental health? Um, so the, we are um, judged in our life on the results. Um, our results make us feel better and coach better. So if we win, we're way more relaxed. There's no pressure on us. We're good coaches. Um, so when I've failed, it's when I haven't um, maintained that calm under pressure. How I didn't have a plan um, to actually take those things that I can't control out of my life. So the worry map, I forgot about it, didn't do it properly, um, started putting my eye on the prize rather than actually the goal, right? Um, most prizes are an equals, right? You do these things, it will equal success. It will equal the prize you're going for. And I think the most important thing is also to understand burnout, right? So um, I was incredibly mentally well, but I've been burnt out as a coach because of the pressure I was under. Um, and once I actually didn't deal with that, and I'm just looking for another PowerPoint because this is really important for coaches, that when you're feeling that pressure, you've got to be careful you don't burn out, right? And burnout will be when the players start suffering from your pressure, that thing you just spoke about, about the eternal, right? So what I learned under pressure was that if I'm not careful, I'll burn out pretty quick. So I do the, um, the five Bs, right? So for me, I make sure that I'm adding more breathing into my day. So I'm taking myself away from that stress. I set bigger boundaries, right? For example, I need to go to the university of no. So I say yes to everything, right? Um, so if you're a coach, maybe you get your assistant to do one of the um, media things. Maybe you switch off social media. Um, you need to take bigger breaks to do to get your energy back, right? And when I say bigger breaks, for me, you heard about my monkey brain. I'll just read a book for longer, right? Don't forget about you. Don't forget about your body, making sure that you're looking after yourself. From In my case, when I was coaching and I was under pressure, um, I would drink too much, right? So make sure that you have the vices, right? Um, that you've got, make sure you look after those. And the last one's really important. Be kind. Guess who too? Yourself. Yeah, man, yourself. And if you're kind to yourself, you'll be kind to your environment and they will perceive that as you handling pressure. Right? Mm -hmm. So be kind because you're in the playoffs, right? So is the whole organization. Your job might be at stake, but no one wants to sack you. They want you to win. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you're kind, and I've I've made these mistakes. I've lost my job three times, you know. Um, and so the three most important things for a coach is understand why you're there. Um, I was there because I wanted every player to have the opportunity that I had. I wanted every player to be the best they could be. I got under pressure and I stopped thinking about that. The second thing is, where are your strengths and weakness technically? You know, what sort of coach are you going to be? Um, the other times I've failed is when I've, I'm not a technical coach. I'm an environment, culture, change coach, right? The times I tried to be technical, you know. Um, and then the third thing I think is, is the most important thing. It's only a game. <laughs> <laughs> moving on, moving on. Right. Yeah. It might be your life. It might be the most important part of your life. But if you sit down and think about it, there are other things in your life that are as important. And if, you, if, if, if there's not, you need to get them in your life. So you mentioned one thing. You said you were a cultural coach, changing culture. It's a big thing. It's a big thing in basketball organizations. It's a very big thing, how to build something from the ground up. And one of my, one of my topics that I wanted to touch on also was – how how is the because the, the people that can change that culture or Im, impact the culture the most are also the leaders right the, the the captains so i was wondering when you go into an organization especially in a in a foreign country and i'm drifting slowly into a, a, the cultural aspect 
whether it's Japan or Italy, and you learn Italian for people who don't know you speak fluent Italian, and some Japanese, I think, as well. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, so what's the first conversation like with the captain? What's when you approach the captain, you do you prepare how do you prepare yourself? What are the things that you are looking forward to addressing to the leader? Uh, and and what do you want to get out of that first conversation? Um, so it probably starts a long time before that. So I try and learn as much about um, the culture. Firstly, I'm a visitor. Mm. Right? Firstly, I'm a visitor. Second, you never spit in the plate where you're eating. Right? <clears throat> very, very important. Um, the second thing is understanding the culture that they've come from. For example, um, in Italy, you need to be their mother and their father, right? So in Italian culture, normally the mum is more aggressive than the dad. So the mum will be doing the discipline at home. They'll be more scared of mum than they are dad, right? <laughs> so when I say you need to be their mum and dad, you can tell them off and be pretty emotional about that, but they need to know that you're going to give them a hug. Mm -hmm. Right. So you also need to understand the cultural environment of the sport. Okay. So what does that look like? The cultural environment of the sport. So there's two cultures you have to learn. And then you have to build the culture on the great things from that. Right. Um, for example, if I said to an Italian, run against that wall, because that's going to help us win. They'd go, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm not going to run against that wall. Hey, Carl, so, hey, man. <laughs> what do you mean? I can't do the wall. <laughs> um, but if you convince them that there's a really nice prize and a success on the other side of the wall, they'll break it down. Mm -hmm. You know, um, The Italians were the greatest soldiers and the worst soldiers because they fought for their captain and their leader. And if he was an amazing man, they were great fighters. If they wasn't, they weren't, mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, and so if I said to a Japanese, run against that wall, they'd run against the wall until they're, until blood came out of their ears, you know. They don't, um, need, they don't need a reason for that. They just, they just follow instructions right away. Yeah, exactly. So um, when I first got to Japan, there was a thing called, um, well, we changed it, right? So they're also rope learned, right? So rogue, rogue learned rogue, what is that? Rogue learned, yeah, repetitive learning. Okay. Yep. Repetitive is the same thing. So for just just for an example, if that's the case and you're in a and you're in a sport where you need to improvise and have vision, how do you do that? So there's mite to see, handan to decide, right? And then action. Mite handan action, right? When I got to Japan. They were doing handa, action, mite, decide, hmm. act, and look. If I can explain that to you, you go to a line out and you call a move before you see what the defense is doing. So how do you turn that round from a playing point of view, but then also how do you understand the culture? And if you understand Japanese culture, um, you should read a lot of books about, you know, Bushido, the seven laws of the samurai. What, why, if I ask you a question, why when you go in to buy something in a shop for $2, do they wrap it like it's worth $100? You know? Yeah. So understanding the culture of the sport you're in, understanding the culture of the country, and then adding to it, not saying you're the best at it. Um, so, yeah, that's how I'd explain that. Yeah, you yeah, you kind of have to be like going humble into the situation, right? And you have to have the right advisors, assistant coaches who kind of guide you through those situations because you you're you're exposed to it for the first time without having really ever grown up or lived there. So it's a completely different approach that you have to have when you go into a new culture. I think you have to be humble first of all to be open to the new information you're absorbing. The greatest successful people I've ever met, I've never met an arrogant asshole. I've only ever met humble growth mindset, people who just want to continue to grow. Now, when you meet very famous people, sometimes they're protective. Mm -hmm. Don't mistake that for, you know, 
they're not going to let you into their circle. They're not going to let you in because they are protective. And sometimes that can come across as arrogance. I call that protective. But most of the superstars that I've met, they are humble. They want to get better, right? And when I you agree. break into the circle, I haven't met too many assholes at that level. I agree. I agree. That's that's a very good point, an important point to make. I think a lot of people mis misconceive that that the perception of, of a super athlete or or a super coach or a high level personality is a, it's a protective mechanism to to really um, shield because also the attention they get is also humongous. So there's at some point they have they have to have the shield. I was wondering just to get circled back on the mental health aspect within the culture of Japan, because I've heard a lot of things about the, how much they internalize. And I was wondering how hard it was for you to break those barriers and not have them internalize their um there are struggles there there's frustrations because there's a lot of from what i heard i've never i've been i've been to tokyo i've been i've been to uh, to other cities but what's how do you deal as a coach when you see players internalizing their uh, frustrations and you want to get the best out of them and make them kind of help them relax a little bit i think you see it in performance and you need to step in and help right um so people who People who internalize, um, normally on the sports paddock, you'll see them living in the past or living in the future. Um, because when you internalize something, you are either living in the past or living in the future. So to get someone to live in the present um, is very much about how their week goes and how you can help them get to the game and just play, mm -hmm. right? Um, normally those that internalize a lot during the game, they'll internalize, make two mistakes in a row or go on a, a downward spiral because they're living in the past and trying too hard for the future. If you can get them to realize that, externalize it during the week, right, um, and practice some of those things, that's what I'd do with someone who internalizes. So how, is there still a lot of uh, the, the suicides in Japan? Is the suicide rate still high? Yeah, it's one of the highest in the developed world, yeah. How come? How come in that culture is that's it's, it's so prevalent? Um, it was it was actually um, an honorable thing to do in their past. Um, mm -hmm. bit of some, from the samurai samurai uh, culture, um, and that doesn't help. Yeah. Um, the second thing is not talking about your emotions and not talking about your stress and pressure. They're getting they're getting a lot better. I went over and did a um, a leadership course with a group of Japanese business medium-sized business owners and I just I was like in their face open honest my journey and every single one of them said to me you know JK as managers of lots of people we're not allowed to talk about this but we deal with it every day you know? <laughs> so this is a worldwide problem man not a not a not a sport unique problem not a you know like I say now I think sports psychology um is probably I love it don't get me wrong but actually these kids don't need it anymore because they can play. It's what's getting in their way yeah. for them to play at their best is, you know, and normally that's the whole lot of life stuff outside. I'm pretty yeah. sure if you, if you go into the, to the Boston Celtics, you know, the, the guy that's not informed can play the game, but he might have some shit going on in his life that he might not be able to um, deal with or, you know, take absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's like you said, information overload from all different areas. Um, That's 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 interesting. I I there was something else I want to talk. I just lost my thought train of, uh, thought that I had. But um, in terms of New Zealand locker room culture, how did that impact uh, the your your coaching when you had it when you in, in the All Blacks locker room? Was that something that that the legacy book describes correctly? Uh, that I read the 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 way it got cleaned up the honorable honorable culture within the locker room that everybody's sweeping the floor that that there's a, some kind of a, that everybody holds each other accountable is that something that's still prevalent and that was always always the, the case when you were there who's the most important person when you go to basketball training That's a that's a very vague question. Um, normally, the coach because he prepares the practices. For me, it's the it's the groundsman. They keep it clean. 
Yeah, for me, it's the guy who keeps it clean, man. For God, for me, it's that guy. Um, he's not any less important than me. Yeah, he's not any less important than the coach. So, um, you know, last night I was, I was, <laughs> I had lunch yesterday at this place, and and I just picked up my plate and took it back to the kitchen. And the guy, the 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 guy said to me, "Oh, thanks, man." We're just so busy. I said, no worries, brother. You know? Um, so I think sport pushes us in a direction of beauty, of 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 achieving our goals, um, of pushing ourselves, of failing, of getting better. Um, but you should never forget where you come from. Never, ever forget that that guy that's, clean the floor so that you can go out there and play um, has a wife and kids at home. He's doing the best that he can, man. Yeah. And so you should never forget those things. And I think for us in the all blacks um, and look, we've all been arrogant. We've all stepped out of this. We've all, but in our environment, you normally get that pretty, pretty quick slap back. Um, you know, so for me, it is a part of life, right? And um you must always remember that. Yeah, we're all human beings. We're all human beings. Before we go into the last segment that I always prepare, uh, there's I, I this came back to my mind was the culture map. It's the book that I I wanted to because when you were talking about Japan, um, have you heard of this book, Culture Map? No, it's, I'll write it it's, down. I'll read it. It's a it's a very good book about high context and low context cultures depending on which which country you're in of how to c communicate. And how to how it's interpreted usually. So how to receive criticism, how to give criticism in a high context or a low context. So there's a differentiation between the Asian countries, the the Western cultures uh, countries, and there's a very good way, very very just very well described of how to um, give criticism without uh, whether direct or indirect. Yeah. Okay. So last the last segment. I usually I usually draw up ATOs to everybody, and, and that's those are like after, after time out place because that's a basketball term but i know that you like your 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 coffee so i'll just call them espressos because they're just quick quick espressos that i'm going to throw at you and uh, i'll see what you come up with Dark. biggest advice to your younger self from your current self be the best you can be one daily habit you can go without shower a book you could recommend Tuesdays with Mari. Finish these sentences for me. Mental health is? As important as physical health. Team culture is defined by? If someone says thank you. Winning is? A result. It's an equals. Pressure is? Beautiful. And the last thing that I always ask my my guests is something that I have from Tim Ferriss, which is my favorite podcast. I have to tell it because I have to give credit to him every every episode. What's your favorite failure in your career, whether it was coaching or playing? Uh, co yeah, what, 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 where, where do you dr draw the most, the biggest lesson from from your past that you feel like it's a, it was a failure, but you look at it and you cherish it because you learned the most from it? Um. I woke up five years ago and felt like I was a failure because I've been the face of mental health in our country for 15 years and our suicide rate's going the wrong way. So um, I changed. I now have um, a charity that has created a curriculum for primary schools that um, I believe can change our kids, our tamariki in Maori. Um, the second thing I did is I believe that business um, is now the community. So I've created a company called Groove. Um, so my charity is the JK Foundation. It's called Mighty. Um, and my business is called Groove. And we've created a digital solution for businesses and mental health and preventative mental health. And what we want to do is teach every individual um, to have a daily mental health plan. We want to lift the leaders to do this properly. So how do you put it on the agenda? We don't want you to be the psychiatrist or psychologist. We just want you to genuinely lead our preventative mental health. 
And the third thing is to optimize your environment. Our goal is to reach 100 million people um, through businesses. And if we do that, we think we can save 100,000 lives. So um, if I re-answer your question, I think the greatest failure I had was my clinical depression. It gave me a better life through the other end, believe it or not. And the second thing was realizing that um, the failure through my mental health has actually given me two things that I think can change the world. John, thank you very much. It's been it's been a pleasure talking to you. And I think that our, our listeners have got a lot out of it. I think they enjoyed it because that's the first of a kind for 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 me and for the listeners and on my podcast. So I'm I'm sure it's gonna widen everybody's horizon. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, man. It's really nice to meet you. Um hopefully I will see you around sometime and meet you in person. I hope that um you know, I hope that you and, and your family are good and you're looking after yourself every single day. And I think that, you know, for me, I went to my dad once. Um, he was unwell. He's been dead 10 years. And he said to me, if you died tomorrow, would you be happy? And I went, wow, dad, that's a big question, mate. And uh, and I started to stumble through an answer. He said, mate, why don't you, he was in hospital. He said, why don't you go home and think about it? If I'm still alive tomorrow, we can talk about it. Um and I went back the next day, you know, and um, and I had all these answers, you know, I want to see my kids grow up, I want to do this, I want to do that. And he said, I didn't ask you that, they're all givens. If you died tomorrow, would you be happy? And I said, no. And he said, well, don't touch death to learn how to live like I did. Right? Mm -hmm. And from that day on, wow. you know what the greatest day is? Today. All we need to do is be great today. And whatever your great is, you know, you can be the greatest groundsman, you can be the greatest basketball player, but just be great in all those things, your family, your relationships. And uh, if you get to the end of the day and you've done it, cool, get up tomorrow and start again. And it just gives you a freedom and a perspective of life that I've, I'll always thank my dad for. So just, well, I know you're late. It's the beginning of the day for me. So you're going to go now and do your to done list and you're going to feel great. And we'll meet again sometime. I will. I will. Thank you everybody for listening. And at John Curvin 14 is your Instagram. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Everybody, everybody give John a follow. I think, a, I think I've got a dot now. I think I've got a tick now. So just check for that apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't post a lot, people, so um, <laughs> I am there. Well, I'll, I'll tag you on the post when I release this podcast, and I appreciate every, uh, everyone listening. And, um, yeah, thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.